Good to be part of this uh, panel, and uh, I've really appreciated the papers so far. In short, my, my paper goes like this. Joshua Swamidas's The Genealogical Adam and Eve, the GAE, has solved several conundrums for conservative biblical scholars and theologians who seek to integrate their work with evolutionary science. This paper assesses GAE's contributions and limitations using four questions. Let me say on the way to presenting this that um, the paper kept getting longer as I worked on it and tried to refine my ideas. So instead of being able to read the whole thing, I'll have to uh, highlight a couple of the sections. Again, to the paper itself. Joshua Swamidas's motivation for writing the genealogical Adam and Eve seems to be summarized in this encounter from the book. Quote, a pastor explains an honest reading of Genesis. His scientist friends object, sometimes incorrectly. The conversation ends, a fracture. This pastor, to use the vernacular, is smacked down by the scientist. Josh wants to avoid this. Why? Because as a scientist, he finds this un encounter unnecessary. To render this fracture unnecessary is certainly a victory in some ways for the interchange of science and Christian belief. It also has its limits. And in these questions, I intend to briefly show how and why. The first, does the GAA, GAE achieve its aims? It seems to me that the first task in responding to a book is to ask its questions, to assess its aims and to see if that, the aims or those uh, are fulfilled. Now, as I do that, I'm seeking to also fulfill my task as I understand it in this session, to analyze GAE as a book primarily and secondarily to take in the papers in this session. I am not interacting, therefore, with the additional criticisms that have arisen around and after the publication of this book. I admit this requires some self-restraint, but I think I'm up to the task. One will have to observe in the encounter by the pastor and the scientists or scientist that there is embedded a fairly literalist hermeneutic, often called in the book, quote, traditional de, de novo account of Adam and Eve. Josh, of course, grew up in a literalist household, as we read early in the book, and so it should not surprise us that Josh has uh, some sympathy with this position. Even if he does not personally advocate this position, he seeks to defend it for the purpose of healing the rupture, he mentions, and creating a peaceful approach to theology and science, one that creates inclusion and not exclusion, to quote from the book. Now, if I'm reading GAE correctly, there is a core GAE hypothesis found on page 10. I want to read it, not to be redundant, but because this is what I'm focusing on. Entirely consistent with the genetic and archaeological evidence, it is possible that Adam was created out of dust and Eve out of his rib less than 10,000 years ago. Leaving the garden, their offspring would have blended with those outside it, biologically identical neighbors from the surrounding area. In a few thousand years, they would become genealogical ancestors of everyone. Now, the key here, um, as Ken Miller so beautifully outlined, is the distinction between genealogical and genetic. And I, I, I want to just see if I can put an emphasis here. This is a truly significant insight. And I am not going to say much more because I suspect all listening to this paper grasp the distinction, especially if you heard Ken's presentation a few minutes ago. It's one of those insights as a person who's been involved um, in theology and science for uh, like 25 years uh, that I find corresponds to the Bible's intent. And it just makes me think, why didn't somebody say this so clearly earlier? Now, it also responds to critics, skeptics like Jerry Coyne, often I'm told called King Coyne um, by those who revere him, on the problems of integrating science with Christian theology. Now, you may know that integrationist is a slur in Coyne's lexicon. Uh, I'll just say it responds to him. And it also uh, re resolves the reading of key biblical texts and their related assertions 
held by around, uh, you know, uh, four in 10 white evangelicals who answer, for example, that, quote, humans have always existed in their present form, end of quote. Given the prevalence of this viewpoint in conversations I've had uh, with various conservative Christian theologians, people in the pew uh, as a pastor, and actually with my own undergraduates at Chico State University, whether the undergraduates actually hold this position or not. And I can tell you that I just read about 50 papers which took up this topic. I find the accomplishment of GAE, uh, I, should, I find this no small accomplishment. And often I also find myself recommending the book to the group of conservative Christians and biblical scholars who are troubled by evolutionary science. But this is a scholarly paper, a critical paper, and you'd think I wasn't doing my job if I didn't bring some critical, as in uh, uh, critical assessment of the book. Second question, what kind of literature are we dealing with when we read the creation stories? Stepping out of the particulars of the uh, Evangelical Philosophical Society into the context of the AAR broadly, I make my point succinctly to save space. The kind of inerrantness biblical hermeneutic found in the GAE hypothesis is not the sum and consensus of Christian scholars who attend AAR. Uh, let me just say I have been chair of either of, both, of the Science and Technology and Religion Program Unit nationally and internationally for the past five years. And in the hundreds of papers and uh, proposals I've read, I have not yet had one paper which looks at this kind of conservative approach to the Genesis texts, the kind of inerrantist approach. And um, so it's, it, I, I, I'm zooming out to a broader perspective, but that per se isn't so important because we know the AAR can be quirky. It is important to me that when I look at creedal Christianity, one that follows the Nicene constant to Neapolitan creed, present in Eastern Orthodoxy, Catholicism and Protestantism, I'm not sure I find this hermeneutic. In fact, I should say, it is, I don't find it as the sum of the biblical approach, the natural approach to use the words of John Calvin. Um, the hermeneutic present in the GAE hypothesis does not in fact constitute the entire quote tradition, end of tradition. I wanna put my finger on that term uh, because the Christian tradition has changed and added new voices in the last 200 years. And uh, maybe one could argue even earlier than that. The hermeneutical position that the GAE hypothesis seeks to defend does not subsume consensual Christianity, to quote Thomas Oden, mere Christianity, to quote Richard Baxter and C.S. Lewis, or what has been believed everywhere, always, and by all in Vince, by Vincent of Lawrence. To give it a little bit of numerical quality, uh, Elaine Howard Eklund and Christopher Scheidel have described the following. When asked to choose a statement that best described their beliefs on creationism, evolution, and God's role, 26.5% of the population believes that only one of the narratives of origins is true. So that's an interesting uh, pulling out of where this fits. Now, um, in another book, I have outlined three positions on Adam and Eve. Position one is the kind of young earth creationist position which rejects modern science. Position two, like what the GAE hypothesis leads to, holds to modern evolutionary science um, as well as historical Adam and Eve. There's a third position represented by people like Francis Collins, James Dunn, Gregory Boyd in his support, uh, C.S. Lewis, the one that I follow. Now, I don't see any compelling reason to say that is the best position. It just, to me, uh, as I assess it, it makes the best sense of the science and the theology. However, if uh, Josh's defense is right, that's just fine. I'm happy with position two. Now, Josh has told me on several occasions that he's not advocating for any particular position on Adam and Eve. But there are points in the book where this position three doesn't seem to be as legitimate as the other. And I, I, I would offer this as a piece of evidence. On page 15, he says this, quote, some of us think evolution is a myth. Some of us think Adam and Eve are a myth, end of quote. What Josh seems to be saying is some think evolution is untrue, but is he also saying some think Adam and Eve are a fiction or some think of Adam and Eve as stories? For the latter, people like John Polkinorn and again, C.S. Lewis see myth as a meaningful story, not as a falsity. Similarly, Karl Barth read the early chapters of Genesis' sagas or historical 
sagas. Now, why is this important? When this position is taken, some of the problems presented and thus solved or resolved by the GAE hypothesis aren't important and don't and dissolve themselves. What does the GAE not prove? These two things, next questions I will highlight quickly. From a philosophical perspective, the book does not prove that science leads to this hypothesis. Instead, Josh asserts that it, quote, de-weaponizes the ecclesial conversation on human origins, end of quote, and is, quote, entirely consistent with the scientific evidence, end of quote. Now, I wonder about that word entirely consistent. Put another way, is there any scientific discovery that makes this position on Adam and Eve particularly compelling? Um, earlier, Ken Miller talked about uh, the 20th century discovery of uh, general relativity and the expansion of the universe. And agreeing with his points, I would still say that it shifted science from seeing a steady state universe, to use a more contemporary term uh, from Hoyle, um, to something that might have had a beginning point. This seemed to point to something like the Christian doctrine of creation out of nothing. I will quote, by contrast, the Tibetan Buddhist leader, the Dalai Lama, who's written this, quote, from the Buddhist perspective, the idea that there is a single definite beginning is highly problematic. If there was such an absolute beginning, logically speaking, this leaves two options. One is theism, which proposes that the universe is created by an intelligence that is totally transcendent. Uh, he has more to say on that, but my point here is there's a, there's a way in which science is leading to something like the Christian doctrine of creation. Remember that all the laws of physics break down in the early seconds even minutes of, um, the, uh, of, of Big Bang cosmology. There's nothing quite like that in the GAE hypothesis. And so I find, again, it does offer a way for some conservative Christians to find that they can accept mainstream science and not lose Adam and Eve. And this is definitely an achievement. Uh, let me add then, I wonder if, um, if there's, if, how does GAE, this is the final, my final question, what would have to change to make the GAE hypothesis invalid? And here I would lean on the problems of ad, ad hoc hypotheses, which it is vulnerable to, um, and as well that it doesn't, in my reading, fit the most philosophically robust view of science pre present in uh, work, for example, by Peter Lipton in the inference to the best explanation. Yes, the GA hypothesis could have been but is it the best explanation we have from the data of scripture and science? I, for one, cannot conclude that it is philosophically robust. I end with no more questions and a conclusion. In my response to the genealogical Adam and Eve, I'm concerned that I may have sounded largely critical in the popular and not the scholarly sense. I apologize if that's the case. I learned when I studied Heidelberg and Tübingen that the Germans find it a compliment when you interrogate their work, even sometimes harshly. To offer no critiques is to slight the work and see it as insubstantial. And so I offer this response as the sincerest form of compliment. Put it another way, I've already mentioned how Josh uses the word traditional to describe a way of understanding the biblical texts and thus Adam and Eve. Now, as I mentioned above, I see the Christian tradition in a different way from this book or at least what's presented in the hypothesis I've mentioned. In addition, I have followed Alistair McIntyre, who's argued that a living tradition is, quote, an historically extended socially embodied argument and an argument precisely in part about the goods which constitute that tradition. With McIntyre in mind, I believe we are here by virtue of Josh's contribution engaging with Christian tradition. I remember my first argument with Josh it was at Catalina Island where I'd gathered the grantees for a project I was directing, Science and Theology for Emerging Adult Ministries. On a beautiful warm fall evening, seated outside a dinner with Josh next to me, I made a rather wide assertion. Modern science invalidates an historical Adam and Eve. Yikes. <laughs> you can imagine that we had a very spirited debate. I've learned a great deal since that evening. One is that my deepest hope in arguing over the Christian tradition is that we might make it more compelling for those outside who are yet intrigued by the unusually compelling gospel message as I myself was when I entered college. Maybe Josh and I are just continuing this argument
back from Catalina as we engage in Christian tradition in understanding the profound and important nature of Adam and Eve. That is, as we argue over tradition in the McIntyrean sense of the word.